and uh, we are recording this session. I'm the moderator for the session today. Welcome, everybody. We expect a few more people to come along, of course, and we'll be letting them in as, as we get started. But um, we'll just want have a, a little bit of uh, preamble stuff here. Um, you can see the slide I'm sharing. The we, if you have any technical difficulties, you can bring that up now. But we um, ask if you have questions to put them into the chat window. There may be a time when we open it up and we'll just take uh, questions uh, out loud as well. But um, with each of the speakers, they'll have um, about 13 minutes or so to give their presentation. And then we'll have about five minutes for questions and answers. Um, and we want to make sure that we fit this in all before the, the full hour ends. Um, this session is being recorded. And I believe I saw Brian, you've already started the recording, correct? Yeah, okay. Brian Cruz is my is a co-host also at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Um, maybe you, uh, many of you hopefully have uh, been aware of what we do. Our website is astrosociety.org. If you're not, not, not aware, you can learn more about us. Um, but in the meantime, let me uh, uh, ask Brian to say a little bit about the uh, one of the features we want folks to be able to use in Zoom today. Welcome everyone, and we're really happy to have everyone here. And so Greg, if you could stop sharing. So one of the things that we're gonna do in an effort to make this as interactive as possible, our speakers from time to time are gonna ask you to respond to some prompts, uh, sometimes about some imagery, sometimes about some of the other content. And so a lot of times the response will be through the annotate feature in Zoom. And so the, a lot of people are familiar with annotation. And so when, when somebody is sharing their screen, you will see basically this view here and it'll say up at the top, you are viewing X person's screen. And then over here where it says view options, if you click on that, it'll open up this pull down window. And then down here, it says annotate. And so you need to select that. And once you select that, then it'll pop open this nice menu bar. And if you're prompted to type in some text like this, then you would hit the text button here, which would open up the ability to enter text. Most of the time you'll be asked to do some stamping or maybe some arrows. And so that would be if you hit the stamp, you would then be presented with a number of tools that you could use to stamp to indicate your selections. So that's basically how the annotation feature works. And so we're very excited to um, make this uh, a little bit interactive. So welcome and back to Greg. Yes. And uh, we, since we are recording and if you don't want to be, you know, be ensure that you're not visibly part of the recording, you can keep your video monitor off, but we actually uh, invite people to show us your face, if you're if you're so if you're willing, um, it does give some feedback potentially to the uh, audience. I mean, to the presenters, and so um, you know, if you're grimace or something, you know, that can, <laughs> or whatever, it, 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 that visual cue can help us as well because this is a little different than the way most of us have have been accustomed to presenting to the public. But but we're all adapting, of course, in this pandemic. I have um, one other. Um, slide I want to show, which is basically our presenter. Um, where's that file? Here we go. The speakers in the order. Okay, do you see the, the names of the three speakers today? Yeah, okay. So uh, each of them, we're going to split this hour up into three parts and uh, First uh, would be Luna Zagarak, and then Alex Galliano, and finally Zian Andu. And these are the titles of the talks, which most of you have probably have already seen on the Bay Area Science Festival um, page for this particular event. So I think we can, I can stop sharing. And is there anything else we need to cover, Brian? Um, did I have, I may have forgotten? I think we've got it. And so let's get started. Yep. All right. First speaker, Luna Zagarak from Yale University. Welcome. Thank you. So hi, everybody. I'm Luna Zagoritz. Um, it's okay. It's a tough one. Um, and today I will be telling you a little bit about cosmic archaeology or how do we know the things that we know. 
So I will now begin sharing my screen and I'm going to play the um, the keynote and I'm just going to ask one of our organizers to nod if you can see me and hear me and I'll take that to mean that everybody else can see me and hear me as well. All right, great. Um, I'm actually, ah, never mind. Okay, so cosmic archaeology. How do we know the things that we know about the sky and astronomy in general? Right? Ooh. Okay. So astronomy is looking up, right? For thousands of years, people have looked up in the sky, seen some stuff and started, you know, having ideas about what is really out there based on that stuff. So now I'm going to ask you to use the annotate feature um, that Brian so helpfully showed us. And can you think of some things that are out there, um, you know, kind of higher than where planes fly maybe, um, than we can see and some things that we can't see? Like, could anybody tell me what, what do you see in the sky? You can shout it out, you can write it in the um, in the chat if that's uh, available, or you can use the text annotation. Birds, okay, we can see birds. It's a good one. Uh, we can see stars, yes. Do you know any other sort of kind of shiny things that we can see other than stars? Maybe big groups of stars, what are those called? Stellar clusters. Yeah, clusters of stars. That's pretty good. The moon. The moon. That's a good one. We can see the moon. We can see like planets and uh, moons and nebulas and stuff like that. Um, my participants are actually blocking what it says other, under what we don't see, but I think that says black holes, um, which is also a good one. Constellations. Yes, a whole bunch of stars together. All right. Right, those are some good ones. Um, so I'm going to ask either Brian or Greg to clear the annotations now. So I had pretty similar ideas like you. Planets, good one. So we can see a lot of light, right? We can see stars, we can see galaxies, we can see clusters of stars and galaxies, we can see planets, we can see meteors, right? Comets, stuff like that. We get, and all of these are kind of shiny things in the sky. And the things that we can see are things like dark matter. This might be something that you've heard of. It's matter that we can't see, it's dark. Dark energy, also some mysterious thing that is dark and that we don't see, but that drives how fast our universe is kind of moving and expanding in the super early universe. And so let's first talk about the things that we can see before we talk about those things that we cannot see. All right, so like I said, astronomy is looking up. So how do we do astronomy? We take telescopes that maybe look like this or maybe look much larger than this, and we take really gorgeous images of the universe like the one that you see on the right, right? Uh, and we use these images to get information out of them. But there's one issue here that I can see, right? When you look at this, uh, when you look at this image really carefully as an archaeologist would, you want to know how far these things are. Right? Because if I take a 2D image of, say, a field and a tree in the background, you don't necessarily know how far that tree away is. So we have this kind of like big central, you know, galaxy nebula thing. And then we have some swirly stuff in the background. But how far are these with respect to the, each other? We have to figure out the depth of the picture, right? Because you just have a projection onto a flat surface. And so the way that we do this is we use a very important fact, which is that the speed of light is always constant. So all of the light that comes to us, um, it has to travel at the same speed to get through some distance. And as astronomers, we do this clever thing of relating this to a, um, to a quantity that we call redshift. So that's this one plus Z quantity, and it kind of measures equivalently how far things are away, but also how old they are, how long it took the light to come here, how long it's taken the light to come to our eyes so that we can see all these lovely shiny things. Um, and so this is related to how big the universe is now versus how big the universe was then. Another thing that we can relate to this to is frequency of light. So uh, they, uh, these things that are far away, they emit some light, it's at a certain frequency, and then we observe it, and it's a certain different frequency because it traveled far. And you might say, okay, but what is, you know, what, why do I care about frequencies of light? Because frequencies of light are really intimately related to colors. If you know what frequency the light is emitting at, you know what color it is. So instead of just taking this telescope and taking a picture, 
we can use filters of different colors of light to take you know, different pictures and say blue versus red versus green and start to get an idea of how much of each color of light there is from an object. Now, this is important because we can start building up these things called spectra. So the very bottom line here uh, is several frequencies of light, light, starting from very high ones that are sort of like the, uh, the bluish ones. Those are the highest frequencies of light that we as humans can see, all the way to the right when there's lower frequencies of light with this reddish ones. And so on Earth, I can take, say, a bunch of hydrogen doing whatever it is that hydrogen does. And if I shine some light behind it, I start seeing these black lines. And these black lines are what's called absorption spectra. They tell me that these are frequencies at which hydrogen is doing something interesting. What it is is not really important right now. We won't think about it. But since my hydrogen in you know, my lab on Earth is very much the same as the hydrogen in our sun or even in diff different distant um, galaxies and stars and stuff like that, I can compare how different these spectra look from sort of farther away sources to my spectra from Earth and calculate how far they are. Because the farther away they are, the more shifted the spectrum is. So for instance, in the lowest case where it says on Earth, you can see a really thick line all, all the way on the left, a thinner line to the right of that, and a thinner line slightly even further to the right. And you can see these three lines are repeated in each of these spectra that are taken from objects that are a different distance, but they're shifted a little bit more or less to the right. And so if I tell you that the, um, that the farther you shift the, this, these spectra, the farther the object that the light is coming from, can you guess which of these objects is the farthest from us? And I'm going to ask you again to annotate. You can put text or a little stamp or anything, or just draw a little circle or a star or whatever next to one of these four spectra that you think is the farthest from us. OK, Kathy has a guess. Ian has a guess. All right, Sage, good. Alex has a guess, all right. Brian. All right, cool. So. All right, Jessica, thank you. So nobody was really, Jinan has a guess? Okay. So nobody was really fooled by the top one or the, um, the third one from the top. So nobody's really interested in those ones. We're coming down between two. All right, so I'm going to ask uh, one of the moderators to erase now uh, and let's take a closer look at these. So, uh, the topmost spectrum is from nearby stars, right? That one's pretty close. And that's why you see this leftmost kind of thick line not that far apart. Uh, the third one is from nearby galaxies, which are farther than nearby stars, right? They're a different galaxy. They're not quite as close as, say, our sun or the clo second closest star, but it's a little farther. Nobody was fooled by those two. But then we have these distant galaxies and these very distant galaxies. And it's a little tricky here because if you look just at the leftmost line that is the thickest, you see that uh, the second to the top one, the very distant galaxies one, has that thick line way to the right of the distant galaxies one. But if you look on the right side, if you look at the right, uh, if you look at the red side of the spectrum, some of the lines are cut off because now they're emitting at frequencies that we just can't see. So if you're looking from the right, you could be fooled into thinking that one is closer and one is farther. But all in all, that's a demonstration of how an astronomer knows how far something is. So we have this pretty 2D image, and we know the distance to the points in the 2D image because we take these spectra and we do, and we do these calculations. So now we have something that looks like the, a 3D image of the sky, right? So now we can look further back into the sky, which means looking back in time because the speed of light is constant. So we can make something like this as a map where on the right uh, is where we are today, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, and we can start looking back, right? We can see uh, galaxies evolving and we can look even further than that to the very first stars and galaxies like baby stars and galaxies just forming. And we can even look further to that where there's not a lot of light because there's not, um, because stars haven't started forming yet. And then we hit a wall. And what is this wall? This wall is something called the cosmic microwave background. 
So if we go way too far back uh, in time, we get to a point when the universe is so hot that electrons and protons are just flying around and they can't really form neutral hydrogen. And so light is trapped in this soup of electrons and it can't escape. So the earliest light that we see is from 380,000 years after the Big Bang. For reference, we live 14 billion years after the Big Bang. And we can't see really any further than that. So it's kind of like we run into this thick velvet curtain that tells us a whole lot about how the universe was 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is very, very cool. But if you're like me, and if you're interested maybe in the first second after the Big Bang, that's not so cool because you can't see past that. And I really, really want to see what's past that. So how do we see past the CMB? We can't, it's opaque, right? But maybe we can think of a different way to probe the universe. Maybe we have to think beyond light, right? So what if we can't see the early universe, but we can feel the early universe? Now, there's been something that's been talked a lot about since 2016. It's been maybe the biggest, uh, the biggest thing in astronomy since then and in physics. And it's the last thing that proves Einstein's general uh, theory of general relativity right. Does anybody happen to know what I'm talking about? It's a little strange and it's a little complicated and it's okay if you don't, but does anybody happen to know what I'm hinting at? If you do, throw, throw on some text or feel free to unmute yourself and just shout it out. Um, but if not, it's also okay, we're going to talk about it. It's weird, right? I'm asking you not how you can see the universe, but how you can feel the universe. Well, the secret is there is something called a gravity wave, which is a fundamentally weird thing because it's the stretching, um, a very small stretching of space time. So like everything around us. And so these two gravity waves are caused when something to like two very massive things collide, like as massive as really enormous black holes, right? So these things are so massive that when they collide, they send kind of like little ripples throughout space time. And it would look something like this. So if you have two black holes that are sort of circling each other and about to merge into like one big daddy black hole, right? These little ripples around them are what we might feel as gravity waves. So they're sort of the same thing as if you're, if you could imagine kind of like uh, just taking two balls and putting them in water and making them kind of rotate around each other, you would see ripples in the water. But the thing is two that- Two minutes. Oh, two minutes? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so the thing is that the water is all around us. And so it's hard to measure it um, because even your ruler would stretch. The way that you measure it is uh, you go back to this fact that I've been underlining, which is that light always travels at the same speed. Uh, and you can use lasers because light doesn't really care about the stretching. Uh, this is a very, very clever thought. And it won a whole bunch of very smart people the Nobel Prize in 2017. Um, and so it's, a, it's pretty exciting and Alex will tell us a little bit more about it. So now that we live in this era when we can't just see the universe, we can also feel the universe with these gravity waves, we live in an era of multi-messenger astronomy, right? So now we have the universe where we can see light all the way out here to the cosmic microwave background, right, through most of the age of the universe. But we also have gravity waves, which can go all the way to the beginning of the Big Bang which is pretty cool. The issue of course, is that the really massive things that we need to produce these gravity waves live over here, which is the area that we can already sort of measure with, with light. It's really cool for measuring things much better and in two different ways. And it tells us all kinds of interesting stuff, but it doesn't really help us get to that early universe that I super wanna see. However, the thing that does happen in the super early universe is the big bang itself. And then something called cosmic inflation that's when the universe expanded really, really, sorry? One minute. Okay, great. Uh, that's when the universe expanded really, really quickly um, in a very short amount of time. And this event might just have been kind of violent and quick enough uh, that we might be able to see very, very tiny gravitational waves from it. And that's an active area of research. So just to summarize, I promise you the universe we can see and the universe we can't see. So the universe we can see is here. We can see this part with light, and we can feel this part with gravity waves. 
right? However, we've only detected gravity waves from here, but this is an active area of research. More gravitational observatories are going up and hopefully we'll be able to feel more and more of our universe and really get those answers past that cosmic microwave background and that thick velvet curtain stopping our light. Uh, on the other hand, it's really exciting to think about the universe we can't see. Uh, there is something called dark energy, uh, which is a really big question that I haven't super talked about in this talk. Uh, my sort of excuse for that is that there's also dark matter, which is my research, in the super early universe, which is also my research. So I have to admit that these are my favorites, and these are the questions that I think a whole lot about. Uh, however, even if this is the part of the universe that we can't see, maybe we can still feel it with gravitational waves. And so I'm hoping that I didn't really leave you feeling, thinking like this about the early universe and how, you know, what we can see and what we can feel, but I left you feeling more like this, Indy. Um, and thank you for coming. Excellent. Thank you, Luna. All right, we can take some questions. Um, you can uh, unmute yourself and, and to say it out loud, or if you prefer to put it in the chat window, feel free to do that. And go ahead and, um, as Brian noted in the chat window, uh, make sure you um, vis make it visible to everyone, not just uh, privately to myself or Brian. Or yeah, they they. Uh, it turned out that uh, Zoom, in all their wisdom, made it so that it uh, they could only chat with me apparently. So. Oh, I got a chat. I, 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 I got chat too. Yeah, oh, I got I got some. Daniel, you had written to me about black holes uh, in one of the chat uh, messages. Did you want to ask more about black holes? I love black holes. Ask away. <laughs> you still with us, Daniel? I can't tell. You might be muted. Yes, he's still here. You want to pose your question out loud or do you want to put it in the chat? You want to do it out loud on mute? Sage Gini says, oh, oh, disappeared. can you feel dark energy with gravitational waves? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so you can sort of, you can't quite feel it because dark energy is this really, really weird thing that we don't know what it is. We know that this there's this whole bunch of stuff in the universe uh, that is making it expand really fast these days, uh, but we don't really know what the stuff is. So I think we would have to know a little bit more about what the stuff is to really feel it with gravity waves. Uh, we can measure how fast our universe is expanding with gravity waves. And so that tells us how much of this stuff there is, but not really what it is. Um, and it's not necessarily energy. That's the name we give it. But the truth is we really don't know. It's a really huge mystery, but that's a really good question. Okay. I have a question still, um, not for me, but from Hazina. She wrote in the chat window to me, it says, uh, what do you think is the most fascinating thing about dark energy? Well, I think the most fascinating thing is that we really, really don't know what it is. Um, I, you know, if if you could tell me what dark energy is, you you would get the Nobel Prize like yesterday. Um, so I I think it would be super super exciting to know what it is. We know sort of what it does for our universe, but we don't know what it comes from or why it's there. Um, so I guess the the answer is all of it is exciting because all of it is so mysterious. All right, I think we have one last question before we have to move on from Daniel. You can you see in the chat, it's a little lengthy. I heard that we can time travel with black holes because inside a black hole, the laws of physics never exist. So time can lead from year 1000 to the year 2001 second. And I'm gonna address that one. Uh, okay, um, so, so I guess nobody has ever gone into a black hole and sort of uh, come back to tell the tale. So there's a lot of, um, sort of calculations and thoughts about what happens when you enter a black hole. Uh, there's this process called spaghettification, which sounds kind of gross, and it is. It would mean that because you're kind of like long, you're not just like a little point in space, right? Uh, kind of your legs would forever be falling into the black hole while your head would forever be kind of like stretched out of its legs and you would be stretched into this one long spaghetti. Um, there are theories that say that there are white holes, which are sort of like everything the black hole sucks in, the white hole spits out. Um, however, thus far, it's only um, thus far it's only theory. Thus far, we don't really have 
uh, we, we've never seen one of these things. So I don't know that it's possible, um, but it's an interesting thought. Excellent, yes. Thank you, Luna, and thank you for those questions from our audience. We will move along to our second speaker today, Alex Galliano from the University of Illinois. Let me share my screen real quickly. Great, okay. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Galliano from the University of Illinois. I'm going to be talking about singing stars and other explosive earworms. This talk is mainly oriented around supernovae, which are the exploding deaths of stars. But it's also gonna be about sonification, which is a way that we can represent data with sound, which is something that I've been thinking about as kind of a, a pet project for the past couple of years. So sonification is not new. I will admit people have been doing it on different data sets for years, but I will also say that sonification has become a lot more popular after one singular event, which uh, I think really brought it to the forefront and Luna alluded to, which was the discovery of gravitational waves. So these are the ripples in space time, as Luna said, uh, thanks very much for explaining them. Um, in 2015, we heard two black holes merging. We felt the gravitational waves, and we could also shift the frequency of those gravitational waves into the audio range. And so when you do that, you get the following sound. So you hear a set of lower pitches and a set of higher pitches. These are just two different ways to represent the signal from these gravitational waves. And so this is really exciting because I think the sonification of this data set makes it tangible to a lot of people. And to really understand how excited the sonification and the discovery of gravitational waves got some people, I think maybe mainly astronomers, but I think a lot of people. <laughs> I'm not sure if that individual at the end is actually an astronomer, but he, he could be. Um, so we, we talk about reproducibility issues in astronomy. Here's the data set reproduced. People are reproducing it all around the world. People are making this sound. And it's really exciting because this is a way of bringing science to everyone and making it more accessible. So the question that I have been thinking about is instead of gravitational waves, what might a supernova sound like? What might the end state of a star sound like if represented uh, in audio. So to think about how we might begin to do this, we have to go back a little bit and think about how we study exploding stars to begin with. And luckily, Luna has already done the hard work for me and explained spectroscopy. So what we do in studying supernovae is we take the light from an exploding star when the sky brightens at a particular point, we split the light up into a spectrum from a prism. And we look for signatures of different elements like hydrogen, helium, carbon, and oxygen. And then we categorize it. So we can say that if this particular supernova had hydrogen and helium in it, it's this type of supernova. If it had carbon and oxygen, it's a different type of supernova. And the reason that this works, uh, maybe don't have to go over this in a ton of detail, but hydrogen absorbs light along the spectrum in particular colors and emits in particular colors based on the physical environment uh, that it exists in. Basically what this tells you is that if you see these lines missing, you have hydrogen. And so this is the visible spectrum uh, around 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. But what we can do is we can also represent this light in frequency space and shift that frequency into a range of human hearing. So maybe we can shift it into a range between 100 hertz at the lowest frequency end and 1,000 hertz at the highest frequency end. And now all of these lines here that represent the unique signatures for that particular element, we can represent as notes, like notes on a keyboard. So when we do that, we get sounds like this. This is the sonification of the spectrum of hydrogen. This is helium. 
should mention that helium sounds a little bit higher because you have more high frequencies in the unique uh, signature along the spectrum for helium. And then carbon. So it's also worth mentioning that as you get to heavier elements, you have more of these lines. And so the audio corresponding to it generally sounds a little bit more muddled, whereas the hydrogen and helium only have a few really prominent lines. And so they're more likely to sound, I guess, purer. Luna also made the really great analogy that uh, helium also sounds slightly higher pitched. And uh, you can think of this as maybe uh, helium and hydrogen, what we're going to talk about in a little bit, are present in a star when it's first born. And at the end of its life, there's a star that has mainly heavier elements. And so you can think about this maybe like the higher pitch hydrogen and helium are like the child, higher energy, higher pitch, so there's a lot going on. And the, the carbon, the oxygen, the heavier elements, maybe a lower pitch, maybe a lower voice, uh, and slightly less energetic. Okay, so now we have those under our belt. And the reason why this helps us for supernova studies is for the following reasons. We can say something about how old a star is based on its chemical composition. So as I alluded to before, stars when they're first born are mainly hydrogen and helium, really mainly hydrogen, but there's a little bit of helium in there. And as stars age and they burn through their different elements, they produce heavier and heavier elements uh, like carbon, oxygen, eventually silicon, and then iron at the very end. And so basically you can get an understanding of how old a star is when it explodes by looking for these unique chemical signatures in their spectra of light from the explosion. And this is really exciting. So to just create this very basic dichotomy, if you have light elements like hydrogen and helium in the spectrum, like we said, the star has these at the beginning of its life. So it's most likely a younger star that exploded. Whereas if you hear heavier elements like carbon or oxygen in the spectrum, you know the star needed to take a long time to create those things. And so it's more likely an older star that exploded. So if you have a younger star, heavy element or light elements like hydrogen and helium, older star, more heavy elements like carbon and oxygen. Okay. So this is how we break down supernovae. The different classes are not really important because they don't, in a lot of cases, represent physical differences uh, in the uh, explosions themselves. They really just represent, we see these chemicals in it, so we'll call it this. We see those elements in it, so we call it this. But basically, this is a really valuable way to begin to start grouping different classes of supernovae. Okay, so we're now hopefully going to use the annotation feature to tie together some of the things that we've been discussing. So I'm going to play four supernovae. These are the spectra of these supernovae at the maximum brightness of their explosion. And you all will have to tell me which of the stars was oldest, OK? So remember, what youngest, hydrogen, helium, oldest, more muddled, lower notes of he uh, heavy elements, OK? So this is star number one. This is supernova number two. Supernova three. And supernova four. So feel free to use the annotate feature and mark anywhere on the screen which of the stars you think is oldest. And in a second, I'll play them through once more. Okay, so just to have one final playthrough. So the answer is, in fact, star number two, explosion number two. This is an explosion called a type 1a supernova. And it's what happens when we think an extremely old star burns up all its fuel and explodes. So the elements that you were hearing in that spectrum is calcium, silicon, iron, oxygen, and magnesium. Now, I should also mention that 
there was some confusion between two and three. I, when I was playing it through and listening for it, I was also having a hard time between two and three. And this is actually a trick because supernova number three is a young star, but it's a young star that's undergone a particular scenario where it's uh, a different star has pulled off all its hydrogen and helium. So all you really hear are the few metals within it. So three is actually a young star, but its spectrum could trick you. Okay, so the next question is, which of the stars is youngest? Maybe I could get Greg or Brian to, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, which of the stars do we think is youngest from hydrogen and helium presence? Okay, I'll play them through again. second. All right, awesome. So it is in fact supernova number four that you're hearing. This is caused by the massive uh, star collapsing called a type two supernovae and they have mostly two hydrogen. Minutes. Sorry, go ahead. Two minutes. Great. So they have mainly hydrogen and helium in their spectra so that's what you're hearing. Now this is really exciting and this is what Astronomers have done for a long time to group and understand the physics of different types of supernovae, but it's gonna be a little bit harder to do that in the future. So the Vera Rubin Observatory, which uh, is set to go uh, online in 2022, I think, will find around a thousand supernova every night for 10 years. This is very exciting and it'll revolutionize the way that we study supernovae because we'll have these large data sets but we're not gonna have the same quality of data for each event as we used to. So Luna also talked a little bit about finding individual images in specific filters of events or pictures instead of the full spectrum. This is what we're gonna get for minute. supernovae. Great, so instead of the full spectrum, we're just gonna get maybe one specific color. So instead of this full symphony of sound, you might just get one tone like this. And without all this information, it's gonna be a lot harder to distinguish supernova and find out about their physics. Now, it turns out we can use host galaxy correlations to learn the differences between supernovae. So basically what we found is that different types of supernovae are found in different types of galaxies. I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit, but just to say that there are some galaxies that form lots of stars. And so you can hear hydrogen and helium mainly in their spectra. They sound a little like this. Whereas there are other galaxies that may mainly have older stars within them and you can hear mostly heavier elements in them like this. And so we can play the same game, but now with the galaxies of these supernovae instead of the supernovae themselves. So let's ask which galaxy is not forming new stars, okay? Remember hydrogen and helium means new stars, okay? Okay, we're running a little bit long on time, but it is in fact galaxy number two that is an elliptical galaxy not forming many new stars. And the very last question that is the culmination of my research, a star exploded, ooh, a star exploded in this galaxy. Did it come from a young star or an old star? Maybe you all saw the answer in uh, the next slide that I jumped to a little bit, but. Exactly, when you hear heavier elements, it mainly came from an old star, we think. So these are the kind of games we play and that we're going to play for upcoming surveys to study supernovae in more detail uh, with the massive amount of data sets that we're gonna get. And I'll leave it here and take any questions. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Alex. Any questions people wanna pose into the chat or if you unmute yourself, you can say it out loud. OK, 
giving proper wait time. Okay, Sage writes, what would it look like to see a supernova? Yeah, great question. So uh, I do observational work on supernovae and also simulational work on supernovae. And observationally, what they look like is a single point in the sky <laughs> that changes in brightness over time. That's about as much information as we can get from them. But again, splitting up that light helps us to get a better picture. Now, in terms of the simulation, you can, of course, create beautiful simulations where you get three-dimensional high-resolution explosion data. But matching that very high-resolution data to the single pixel in your image that you're able to see is really hard. Any other questions? You may unmute yourself if you want to just make it easier for yourself. Go ahead and ask out loud. Daniel writes, what is the lifespan of a star? Great question. And it depends on the size of a star. So uh, the general trend uh, for really hot stars is they, that they burn bright and burn out quickly. And so really big stars tend to burn hotter and faster. And depending on the mass, you could end up becoming a neutron star, which is where it collapses in on itself and has a very dense core resulting. Uh, you could also have a black hole if it's more massive. You could have a white dwarf, which is a type of star. I'm throwing out lots of terms right now, but basically there are lots of pathways for what a star could become after its life uh, span. And that lifespan could vary like crazy depending on the size of the star. It could be billions of years. It could be millions for the live fast, die young kind of stars. So he says, if a star is small, its lifespan is very long, question mark? Yes. So actually some of the smallest stars uh, known as white dwarfs uh, were used to set some constraints on the age of the universe because some of them are around the same um, time span. So Diane sent a note um, to me. So um, she said, when will our sun become a supernova? So our sun has been burning for about 5 billion years, and I believe it's set to burn for another 5 billion years before you see any major changes in it. Uh, there's a complicated sequence as it changes from its stable state to a series of more unstable states until supernova. Um, but I think it's something that we're not going to have to worry about, at least. OK, there's a couple of things in it, but we didn't got to do the answer this quickly. What the uh, Samia wrote to me says, what stage is our sun at? Um, but then Sage writes, if you were right up next to a supernova, what would happen? Okay. Pick either one of those questions. Where's so very quick, very quickly, our sun is in the main sequence phase, which is the stable burning phase of its life. So it's, it's stable. It varies in brightness very minimally. Uh, if you were right up next to a supernova, what would happen? That is an active field of research. And there was a paper that just came out by a colleague of mine suggesting that a mass extinction on Earth might have been caused by a sweeping of wind caused from a nearby supernova. Uh, and I can send you the details about that if you're interested. But we don't know for sure. OK. Yeah, you could write a private message to Alex if you wanted to follow up with anything. Um, all right, we will turn to our third and final presenter uh, this afternoon, and that will be um, Zina Ndu, and, and she can share her slides. She's from UC Riverside. Thank you, Greg. I will start right here. Hello, everyone. My name is Zina Ndu, and I am the outreach director and a postdoc scholar in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside, so in Southern California. Today, I will actually be also talking a little bit about my own research, uh, and that is related to galaxy briefing. So to start with, I would like you to think about what objects we could typically find in a galaxy. So feel free to, to type in anything in here uh, using the annotate feature. So for example, we could find Oh, great. Yes, yeah, stars. Um, any, other, any other thoughts? Well, we know there are 
planets or comets in the solar system. Yes, planets. And the solar system is also in the Milky Way. Yes, supernovae, yes. Asteroids, great. Any other things that you could think about? Dust, oh, wow, these are all great, great answers. Black holes, meteors. Moose, Plutoids. <laughs> yeah, so all these um, objects we can find um, in a galaxy. And um, if someone could help me clear that. <laughs> uh, quasars, I'm guessing that's, uh, oh, quarks, yes, space garbage, of course. Uh, those are things that we, we don't necessarily want. Um, so some of the, uh, the things that we have already mentioned, right? So we have stars uh, in a galaxy. We could have group of stars, which we call star clusters. And those are group of stars that are gravitationally bounded uh, together. We could also, well, we have a supermassive black hole at the center of every single galaxy, including our own. And there is also gas in a galaxy. And this is what we will be focusing on today when talking about galaxies breathing. So before we get into the really fun science behind that, um, I like to do another poll again. And this is asking, uh, do you think stars have anything to do with gas? Um, and again, you could use uh, the annotate feature, use the st stamps to poll. Um, do you think stars form from gas and can expel gas? Or they're sort of just doing their own stuff, but um, stars are surrounded by gas. So I'm giving a little bit of time uh, for you to, to think about it. Okay, um, any other ideas? I guess we are seeing sort of, um, is, is that a converging answer almost here? Okay, well, maybe not. So we do have uh, different opinions, it looks like. And this is uh, what I will actually be talking about during my talk. And uh, we will find out the answer later. So hopefully I'm, I'm doing a good job explaining things afterwards. All right. So in fact, stars actually form in very dense and cold clouds uh, made of molecular hydrogen. Under very small instabilities, uh, the clouds collapse and they attract more surrounding gas to gain mass. And that's when stars are formed inside of those dense clouds. One very famous star for forming region is uh, in the constellation Orion, which we can see in the sky in fall and winter. And the Orion Nebula is uh, a very well known star forming region. And through the Hubble telescope, we could also see the pillars of creation in the Ego Nebula. Um, so they are actually immense columns of cold gas and the newborn massive young stars are actually embedded inside. So I do appreciate that Alex has already set the stage for me and done the, the hard work. Um, this is uh, what we call again, uh, well, after the, the birth of the stars, uh, the star would continue on main sequence for 90 over 90% 90 of their lifetime. So that's when they are structurally stable and have relative constant energy output. Um, during this stage, the inward pulling gravity would balance the outward pushing pressure. Um, on the main sequence, the star would uh, be burning hydrogen in its core, fusing hydrogen into helium at a very steady rate. So the light and heat generated by this fusion activity can provide enough pressure fighting against the inward pulling gravity. So for our sun, uh, it's been burning steadily already for almost 5 billion years. And for another 5 billion years, it will just keep doing the same thing. And uh, in the end, well, it would actually not explode as a supernova, uh, but a, a, more, a, a, a more gentle death uh, that we, we would say. It's, uh, it's going to form a planetary nebula. However, um, once the star runs out, of a, uh, runs out of hydrogen to burn at the core, the outward pushing, 
pressure would actually decrease. And at this moment, gravity would win momentarily. So that would cause the star's core to contract, compressing helium, which we got uh, from hydrogen burning, right, at the core, um, uh, just to contract. And while the core contracts, the temperature increases. It increases until the point where uh, the core's temperature is high enough to actually burn helium. So at this point, uh, helium starts burning and it actually reestablished the balance between gravity and um, uh, in inward pulling gravity and outward pushing uh, pressure. So similarly, when helium again runs out at the core, um, the core contracts again, compressing itself really hard, uh, temperature increases until the temperature is high enough to burn carbon. So as a result, and uh, this is also like a very similar thing that you would you have already seen on Alex's slides, um, is that many heavier elements, um, heavier than hydrogen and uh, helium, they are created inside of the core of a massive star. Um, we start at the core um, here, that's, that's the heaviest element um, a star could possibly uh, create. And as we go uh, from the core to the surface, we start to see lighter and lighter elements. So all these heavy elements could be produced um, at the core of a star and specifically a, a high mass star. So for massive stars, uh, the fusion goes on to form all kinds of heavy elements, uh, including carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, neon, silicon, and all the way to iron, at which point it just cannot fuse anymore in the core. So the fusion stops at iron. And when the nuclear fusion ceases, uh, since there's no outward pushing pressure anymore, gravity will just dominate and there will be a violent gravitational collapse for massive stars. So the iron core would get further compressed into a neutron star or a black hole, while almost all the other materials surrounding this tiny core would just free fall onto the shrinking core. And when it hits the core, it gets splashed out. So that was a very, very violent and drastic um, process. So this will result in a splendid explosion uh, that we call supernova explosion. And the compressed core will just remain as a neutron star or a black hole at the center. So on the left here, we see that this is an artist's impression of a supernova explosion. And on the right, it's actually a, a real picture um, of the Crab Nebula in the constellation Taurus, which is a supernova remnant. So now, if we're getting back to this question again, um, do you think stars are interacting with gas? Or no, they are simply just co-spatial. Um, happen to be co-spatial, uh, but not really doing anything with, it, with each other. So hopefully, after uh, w the story that I've just told you. Yes, I see people annotating here. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, um, so stars actually form from gas and can also expel gas. So they're always constantly interacting. And I'm gonna put my circle here too. All right, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to clear this. Thank you. Uh, when a massive star dies as a supernova, um, a lot of the heavy elements it has created would get released back to the interstellar space. And these heavy elements will be picked up by the next generation of stars when they form. So since supernova explosions are very violent and energetic, they are able to blow the polluted, or what we call more technically, um, chemically en enriched gas outside of the galaxy. So this polluted gas contains a higher fraction of heavy elements that were created inside of the star. So in this, thank Two you. Minutes. Yes. So in this picture, you can actually see uh, that the galaxy is edge on, meaning that you're looking at the disk this way instead of like face on this way. So the red color gas is uh, the gas that we observe is actually getting ejected outside of the galaxy. Um, and aside from ejecting gas, galaxies can also uh, get gas from the, in the uh, intergalactic space. 
So this picture shows a simulation of the galaxies accreting gas um, gaining its mass. So these streams of uh, gas actually contains a lot less heavy elements. And therefore we can consider them as relatively fresh. So now we know galaxies can take in fresh gas and they can also expel polluted gas. So if now we are to use the annotate feature again and now select draw um, and try to draw a one ended arrow, how would you draw the gas flows both in and out um, inside uh, in and out of a galaxy? So just, okay, thank you. Um, and you can select the, the draw option right here. Uh, this. So for example, um, if I were to draw a, a galaxy, uh, yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, you, you guys got this. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry. And that is outflowing gas. Yeah, what about, um, are, are there gas also getting into the galaxy, do you think? Great, so they're both in and out, right? That's terrific. So um, if I were to add my own arrows, that would be like this. Um, so we have, um, can someone help me just clean, clean this up? Thank you. We have the fresh inflows and also the polluted outflows. And sometimes if the outflows are not at high enough speed, they would also recycle back and creating what we call the galactic fountain. So the stars uh, that are formed uh, in the next generation would also pick up these recycled little polluted gas. And finally, I'd like to make an analogy of the gas flows in galaxies to our own human uh, respiration. So we breathe in fresh air, uh, that is a lot of O2 um, and low in carb carbon dioxide. We metabolism, um, we do the metabolism in our body. And when we breathe out, there is a higher fraction of CO2 in the exhale, right? So this is the same thing with uh, galaxy respiration, as we call it. It takes uh, more of the fresh air um, that contains only hydrogen and helium, and it breathes out. It breathes out uh, gas that con contains more heavy elements. But what is the metabolism in here that we're talking about? It's actually a star formation. Um, so uh, gas that it takes um, uh, from the cold streams, it would form gas. They are born, they evolve, and they create heavy elements in themselves and finally release them and eject them out, forming this um, polluted exhale that we're seeing. Okay, so this is my summary slide. And before I end my talk, I also just wanted to make a quick comment why I also say metabolism um, is similar to um, star formation. Because uh, when we me me metabolize materials, that's what keeps us alive, right? So if the metabolism in our body stops, uh, we are also considered as dead. And that's the same thing for galaxies. Um, on the left, it's actually um, a galaxy that's actively forming stars and we're considering it as very active in star formation. But on the right, um, that is a galaxy that's already dying, if not completely dead, because there are very few stars that are form forming inside of that galaxy. So if a, a galaxy has no more uh, new star formation activities going on, then we just consider it as dead. Okay, so I'll end here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Zinan. There are a couple of questions in the chat window if uh, you want to read them yourself and reflect on it. The most recent one, which I think might tie into what best. So does this mean the star formation will continue forever? Uh, oh, well, that is a great question. Um, no, it doesn't mean that star formation will continue forever. It will only take place when there is available cold gas that could form stars, right? For example, even there's still available gas, but they're super hot, like in a supernova remnant. Um, they cannot condense necessarily to form new stars. And uh, having a lot of supernova explosions going on um, and having those hot gas just uh, hanging around in the galaxy, that could 
uh, temporarily just pause the star formation um, off that galaxy. So, it we have, yeah. Very good. We have a couple questions tied into uh, elements heavier than iron. Um, how is that, what is the origin for that? And another person says, is there a heavier elements in stars than iron? Yes, um, great question. So uh, they are elements in stars that are heavier than iron, but they're not created in the core. They're not uh, created during the nuclear synthesis processes that I just uh, presented. Uh, it's actually when they become a right giant and in their envelope, um, there is what we called a neutron capture um, uh, processes that could create uh, elements uh, higher than iron, but they're not at the core because um, you know fusion stops um, at iron in the core. And uh, do stars still breathe after dying? That is another great question. So for our human beings, we definitely do not breathe after dying. But for galaxies, uh, there is a chance. So if they are later at a later time, say uh, one galaxy merges with another one, and this new one happens to be like really rich in gas, then of course this dying galaxy could just grasp all that gas and then form new stars um, in itself. So there's still a chance for it to be like revived from, from, from die, death, right? But uh, it would have to be um, depending on whether they're available cold gas or not. Okay, excellent. Those are great answers to those questions. And uh, afraid we have to wrap now. It's just a minute past the top of the hour. Thank you so much to our three speakers, Luna, Alex, and Xenon. It was wonderful today. And uh, look for more events with the Bay Area Science Festival um, through tomorrow, I believe, is the end. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Take care and look for the recording 